From the Schmoes No Network Studios in Los Angeles, California, it's time for Profiles with your hosts, Alicia Malone and Scott Mance. Hello, Hello Schmoville. You should see the dance we do during that intro. It's just a little whoop, whoop. It's a lot of this. It's a good thing you don't see it. <laughs> but this is our fourth episode of Profiles. Yes. And this is the one. I think that we've been most excited about so far and mm -hmm. you asked for this one we couldn't wait to do this one finally we are talking about Martin, Martin Scorsese. Scorsese now before we get into why he's such an important filmmaker I thought Scott we would end the debate once and for all on how to pronounce his name should say I have a clip of Scorsese pronouncing it for you guys can you roll it hey it's Marty Scorsese there you go. That Marty was from Scorsese. Hey, it's Marty Scorsese. Marty Scorsese. So <laughs> that is what we are going with. But why would you say, Scott, that Scorsese is such an influential filmmaker? Well, look at his body of work. Going back to the early 70s, you know, you have films like Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, uh, Casino, Wolf of Wall Street, The Departed. <laughs> you know, these movies are groundbreakers. They're game changers. They have a signature style. Nobody shoots a movie quite like Scorsese. This is a director often imitated, never replicated, although some have tried. And in between all that, he produces other things. He directs documentaries about famous musicians. Yeah. What about you? He speaks a lot about film preservation, which I really like. He's such a great storyteller. I mean, he's created some of the most memorable characters and the most... Uh, outrageous and fun dialogue to say and Definitely. also his style he's very provocative he's very violent but the camera for him is like another character you know what else about it, it is about scorsese he's like you and me and the rest of us out there in schmoville he is a film nerd yeah he has been involved with documentaries and written books he knows his stuff about film and i think you can see a lot of influences on his movies and he turns he turns 72 years old on november he's 17th still going. he's still going but here's the thing he's still challenging himself I mean, look at 2011 he did his first family film with hugo yes that was a wonderful movie and his first time doing a 3d film and it had some of the best and most effective 3d effects i'd ever seen in a movie at least since avatar yeah but it was still it was a grown-up fairy tale and film preservation was very much a part of that movie Definitely. and then last year look at the wolf of wall street incredible movie incredible movie he said he wanted to make a film that was fierce and ferocious he did that. And it was. It sure was. So let's get into the show with our segment we call It's, it's a, a Wonderful, wonderful life. life. Roll it, Chate. Martin Charles Scorsese was born on November 17, 1942, in Queens, New York, to Italian American parents who worked in the garment district. His father, Charles, was a clothes presser, and his mother, Catherine, was a seamstress. After considering a life in the priesthood, Scorsese graduated from New York University's film school in 1964. He directed his first feature in 1967, Who's That Knocking at My Door?, which would team him with two longtime collaborators, actor Harvey Keitel and editor Thelma Schoonmaker. Scorsese finally broke through with 1973's critically acclaimed Mean Streets, his first of eight movies with Robert De Niro, which was followed three years later by Taxi Driver, the instant classic that won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. Over the next four decades, Scorsese would come to be nominated for Best Director eight times and won his long overdue directing Oscar for 2006, The Departed. Scorsese has three children and has been married to Helen Morris since 1999, and everyone calls him Marty. Now, there was a suggestion from Schmoville to put music underneath that, and I did do a version with music. I obviously forgot to send it. So, but anyway. Next time. Ken has such a wonderful voice. So Ken has a great voice. We love the pit boss. But what was your first blood? The first blood <laughs> is the first movie by this filmmaker you ever saw. What was your first blood from Marty Scorsese? It was Cape Fear. Cape Fear? Cape Fear came out yeah. in 91. I was probably like 12 or 13 by the time I saw it. I saw it with a bunch of friends. We like to watch films that freaked us out. And Cape Fear definitely did that. I mean, 
It does have the trademarks of a Scorsese film with the religious overtones, but growing up watching a lot of Hitchcock, I could see a lot of that influence oh, yeah, on sure. it from the opening credits to the score by Bernard Herrmann, uh-huh. who worked a lot with Hitchcock, and the use of tension. Robert De Niro was terrifying in that movie, which of course was a remake. And so it's kind of the most mainstream, I'd say, of Scorsese's films. It is definitely... It feels very different, so I didn't discover the real Scorsese till later on. But that was mine. But, well, listen, Cape Fear is a terrifying and very intense film. That last scene on the boat when Max Cady, Robert De Niro was torturing Jessica Lange and Nick Nolte. Oh, my God, that scene is just so intense. (sighs) My first blood was Taxi Driver. Yeah. Now, my parents, in, in their infinite wisdom, and these are the same parents, last week we talked about to the Shining. To see The Shining. So they took me to see Taxi Driver. How old were you? I was 12, so it was around the same time that I saw The Shining. Now, Taxi Driver came out in 76. Yeah. So I saw it in 1980, around 1980. I was about 12. And, you know, back <laughs> in those days, theaters kept movies in theaters for a really long time. And this was a revival house, which so was showing Taxi Driver. And I remembered the you talking to me scene I mean that's iconic yep I remembered that last brutal shootout scene my gosh so you were the same age as Jodie Foster and people were saying she shouldn't have been involved in that scene because she was too young and I shouldn't have been watching that movie no. I was too young but remember that last scene when he shot the guy in the hand he's like I kill you I kill you I kill you I kill you oh my god even to this day that scene is terrifying it is the reason why I'm still afraid to go into taxis the irony being that uh, I'm in the taxis. Oh, yeah, you are. If you go to New York, you can see Mance and his reviews in the taxis. In taxi TV. So give your cabbie <laughs> a good tip. But that's the reason why I'm very much about the Uber. <laughs> God, well, we will be talking more about taxi drivers soon. But now let's get into our fast five with our fifth favorite Scorsese film, which is, Chate. And the Oscar goes to The Departed. <laughs> Ah, yay, Marty! Yeah, so we are putting this one in our top five for several reasons. I know there'll be people out there who object to this, but yeah. for several reasons. One, you're rewatching it, it's really good. It's a great movie. Two, it's the film that finally won Scorsese the Oscar. And three, it is such a great example of. Marty and Leo and their collaboration. Third time they worked together. Third time they worked together. And actually, this was the first time that Leonardo DiCaprio, who I, I've always liked him as an actor. He makes all the right moves, makes great choices, challenges himself. You know, he's very much like Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise that he takes chances with his career. But when he did when he did 2002's Gangs of New York and 2004's The Aviator, and he was great as Howard Hughes in The Aviator, yes. I felt like he still looked too young to play those roles. I agree. This one felt like he was a man who's he scruffy felt, and cool. He was scruffy and cool and stressed out and strung Sexy. out and mm. just totally uh, his nerves were completely shot <laughs> and his eyes were bloodshot. He had the, the, the growth and the stubble and everything. Yeah. But I felt like it was the first time I'd seen Leo I- in a movie of any kind, especially a Scorsese film, where he fit, he grew into his role. This movie came out October 6, 2006. It was nominated for five Oscars and won four, as we know, Best Picture, Best Director, but also Best Adapted Screenplay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and Best Editing, Thelma Schoonmaker, her third Oscar for editing. I mean, she's incredible. She is. And this has all the hallmarks of a Scorsese movie with being the mob and these backroom deals and all the double crossing. What I love about it is this cat and mouse game. And Jack Nicholson is brilliant as uh, Frank Costello. Originally, that role was supposed to be Robert De Niro. Oh. And he turned it down. And people say that this is kind of an example of uh, De Niro sort of passing the torch to DiCaprio, who is now, of course, working a lot with Marty. Well, they they, uh, work together eight times. And we'll discuss a bunch of them coming up. But the way Jack Nicholson is as Frank, the the Irish mob boss, thought it was a really wise move for Scorsese to to move the location from New York to Boston mm. and to switch it from the Italian mob to the felt Irish new. mob. It felt new. It definitely felt new. But I, I felt like if he would have done the New York mob again, it would have felt, even by Scorsese standards, like a cliche. Mm-hmm. But how great is Jack Nicholson as mm. the mob boss, Frank? And he, Woo. that scene at the bar when he suspects that Leo is a rat. Yes. And they're sitting across from each other and, and, you know, he, he just that gets face. that face. He talks talking about a rat. 
<laughs> starts talking about the rat, and you're just watching him go like, oh my god, oh my god, he's going off here. And then uh, Ray Winston sits in the chair as as Nicholson is walking away, and he walks up behind Leo one last time, and, and like goes, like he's like, I smell a rat. It's such an intense scene. Of course, it's a remake of a Hong Kong movie. And uh, we were talking about this with Josh, the engineer, JTE before. And Josh, you said you preferred the original? Yeah, it's a tough. I don't want to get in too much trouble. Um, <laughs> a lot of people like this movie. I was a huge fan of the original film, Infernal Affairs. And I remember being in film school at the time and telling everybody, you got to watch this. I was giving them the DVD. And then they announced, you know, Scorsese and this great cast. And I'm thinking to myself, I would love to see this same cast with Scorsese, but a film that I don't already love. Yeah. And I don't want to like get into spoilers because there's definitely some big changes. Yep. The biggest change for me is I never liked Matt Damon's character in The Departed. I don't think you're supposed to. <laughs> you're not supposed to. In the original, you actually feel for that guy because he's been a cop for so long that he kind of has become a good guy. Right. Oh, I see. He's yeah. stuck in between this where I, I'm doing bad things, but I'm kind of a good guy. And also the big difference is I think in Departed, it's only like two or three years he's undercover. Mm -hmm. In the original, it's 13 years. Oh, Both wow. guys is undercover for like 13 years. Wow. Well, so I like The Departed more than Infernal Affairs. For one thing, there's more of it. Uh, the Departed is 50 minutes longer <laughs> than Infernal really? Affairs. Yeah, it's 50 minutes longer. But here's the thing about The Departed. It's a remake, like Cape Fear is a remake. Mm -hmm. But more than Cape Fear, I felt like The Departed felt like Scorsese made it his own. Agreed. And there are two reasons for that. One reason is when he signed on to direct the departed he didn't know that it was a remake of infernal affairs yeah so he came to it clean came to it clean and he stayed clean because he didn't go back to watch infernal affairs until after he was done directing the departed wow well we asked schmoville their thoughts on the departed and jar silvera hopefully i get your name right otherwise just blame my accent he says that the cast are all magnificent in their roles dicaprio showed in this film that he is not a pretty boy with acting prowess but go. an actor who can deliver spectacular moments that can get you on the edge of your seat damon and Wahlberg are all great as well but the standout was jack nicholson he was brilliant in this film and his character was so menacing and evil to the point that he gave me chills of fear me too definitely while the guru ramanathan had this to say about the departed martin scott says he does a fantastic job directing a film in which the big twist is known within the first 20 minutes and yet you are intrigued enthralled that is true. and excited Cited throughout the entire film nonetheless everything from the performances to the score to the cinematography all magnificent it's one of two movies in which i'll say the remake was better there you go jate <laughs> scorsese absolutely without a doubt 100 percent earned his oscar for that movie which he should have gotten 16 years earlier for goodfellas and by the way Ray. i have this to say about the departed now obviously the movie won best picture and best director yes and i reviewed the departed back in 2006 yep and I, I love the film. And in fact, I loved it so much that on the DVD for The Departed, if you flip it over, <laughs> it actually says Martin Scorsese's best film since Goodfellas, Scott Mance, Access Hollywood. This guy. But there, when he won the Oscar, there was some debate. There was some controversy about the fact that he won the Oscar. And this was, this was a review that was written at the time mm -hmm. about The Departed. Quote, it's a terrific movie that finds Scorsese back at the top of his game, but it isn't likely to win any major awards at next year's Oscars. Whoops. I repeat, this reviewer said it isn't likely <laughs> to score any major awards at next four? year's Oscars. And it won four. And who wrote that you review? You know who wrote that review? <laughs> this guy! This guy! Oh, can't pick them all. <laughs> but, won't you agree that, that it was not the film that you would think Scorsese would have won no, his Oscar for. No, I think people can all agree that he won the Oscar more for his body of work right, but, than The Departed. But since we've been binging on Scorsese movies lately, going back and watching it again, it is a friggin' amazing movie. Amazing scenes in that one and amazing scenes in a lot of his movies. So The Right Stuff yes, is the where right we stuff. talk about our favorite scenes. And mine, I'm going to choose one that's just not in our top five, but is a really great film. The Wolf of Wall Street. Okay. The Quaalude scene. Oh. If you have seen this movie, you will know what I'm talking about. It's when Jordan Belfort takes a lot of Quaaludes and they take a while to kick in. When they do, he loses all power over his body and his speech. And yep, the man! 
<laughs> and then he's crawling to his car. Now, when I first saw Wolf of Wall Street, I didn't like it at all because it made me feel really sick. And then after a while, I realized, well, that's kind of the point. Sure. And it's scenes like this that make you feel so much hate for this character. I mean, yeah. here he is and he is spending a lot of money. He's out of control. He doesn't even care about himself or his health. He just wants to get high and have a good time. Cheats on his wife. Yeah, cheats on his wife. He's a horrible character. Um, and this scene was so over the top, so heightened. And I think it's a great representation of the whole movie. I like that the part at the end of that scene where he goes... Maybe I didn't get home okay. Yeah. <laughs> then you then see the car. Oh yeah, you go back and you see the car. Well, Scorsese <laughs> is all about the details. When you watch his movies, and even especially when I was watching The Departed again, and just like the way certain cuts were done mm -hmm. and the way things must have been set up just to do that one or two second cut. It's all about the detail. There are a lot of details, less details, a lot of trivia <laughs> about Martin Scorsese. So did you know, speaking of The Departed, that instead of starring Matt Damon and Leonardo DiCaprio, mm -hmm. the original stars of that film were cons that were considered were Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. Interesting. Would have been an interesting movie. First of all, it would have made sense because Brad Pitt's Plan B produced That's The Departed. Right. Yep. But Tom Cruise would have played the Leo part and uh, Brad Pitt would have played the Matt Damon part. And you could, I could see them doing that. Wow. I could yeah, see them I could. doing that. And I'd actually like to see them go head to head. Yeah. That would be really interesting. Well, speaking about casting, did you know that Martin Scorsese was actually offered the role of Charles Manson in the TV movie Helter Skelter? He was, oh, wait, to, to act? To act. Not to direct. Not to direct. To act <laughs> as Charles Manson, but he turned it down. <laughs> Way to go score, Probably Marty. Probably wise choice. Yes, that would have been, oh man, how do you live that down? Yeah. But uh, uh, some more trivia. Did you know... That for the role of Iris in Taxi Driver, 1976's Taxi Driver, which won uh, Jodie Foster an Oscar nomination mm -hmm. for Supporting Actress, some of the other actresses that were considered for that role actually went after that role were a very young Carrie Fisher, ah. Bo Derrick. Interesting. Interesting. Way before 10. Mariel Hemingway. Yeah, I can imagine that. I can, ima I can see that. Yep. And Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, wow. There you go. And Jodie Foster was brilliant. Well, she was. did you know that Scorsese has taught both Oliver Stone and Spike Lee at the at NYU in a film class. He taught them both? At separate times. But oh, okay. Same, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but during a class, he would go and lecture and Oliver Stone would be sitting in the audience watching. Well, Oliver Stone's movies, especially in the early 90s with like Natural Born Killers, I felt like they got really hyperkinetic. Mm -hmm. But Spike Lee, I could actually see... Yeah, it's got the New York influence. The New York influence, the way he uses his camera sometimes with like zooms and 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 uh, uh, holding shots for a really long time. I mean, he's made it his own. I mm -hmm. mean, I certainly don't think of Martin Scorsese when I watch a Spike Lee movie, but knowing that he learned a little from him, I could see, okay, I get that. No question about it. Okay, well, let's keep going with our Fast Five. At number four, we have... Be my little baby. So, of course, this is from Mean, mean Streets, Streets, which was uh, music was really important in this movie. Okay, music was really important in this movie, and it was the first of many movies that would be done in this way. Mm -hmm. Now, Mean Streets was released on October 2nd, 1973, but this was a breakthrough movie, not only for Martin Scorsese as a director, but also for Robert De Niro as an actor, yes. Johnny Boy, the first of eight collaborations between these masters of cinema. And when you're watching, when you were watching Mean Streets, as we did just in the last couple of days, <laughs> yeah. I was immediately struck by how much this felt like a precursor to Goodfellas. It definitely does. This is uh, Score says his first critical success and you can really see his style developing and coming through. I like that him and De Niro actually grew up really close to each other, but they didn't know each other when they grew up. They were yeah. introduced to each other, I think, by um, De Palma. Brian right, De Palma, oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Through that connection. Um, and, you know, before this movie, Scorsese had made Boxcar Bertha oh, yeah. with Roger Corman, which was an exploitation film. And Corman said to Scorsese, you can go and make another one if you like. He almost did. And then John Cassavetti stepped in and said, 
you know what? Don't waste your talents. Go and make something that means something. And this does mean something. something, So Scorsese said, well, yeah, I've got a script actually. It's called Season of the Witch, but it needs a rewrite. So John said, Go and rewrite it then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he did, and it became Mean Streets. Well, Mean Streets came out in 73, right in between 1972's The Godfather yes. and 1974's The Godfather Part Two. Well, people say it was an antidote to The Godfather, don't they? Because The Godfather, brilliant film, but glamorized mob life right, it definitely and, that, did. and the family life, and it was very sumptuous in terms of the cinematography. This was down and dirty and gritty. Very gritty. It's also not nearly as polished as as Scorsese's later films. And a lot of people might argue that Mean Streets might not even be worthy of being on this list for that reason. But it's because it was such a breakthrough movie and because it was autobiographical mm-hmm. for, for Scorsese that the movie landed on our list. And it set the precedent for so many things that Scorsese would come to do. We just talked about the rock music yeah. and the way the songs weave into one, one another. No one really did that before him. I mean, they would definitely have music as a background to set a, a time or a mood. But using music in this way in Main Streets, it was almost surreal at times. It's kind of a mixture between realism and expressionism with the slow motion and the great cinematography. Uh, And it just lent so much to the film having these music tracks. Well, the music tracks, which Scorsese picked from his own record collection, yeah. by the time he had to clear them from music licensing, that ate up half of the film's budget, <laughs> oh gosh. which is why it looks so gritty and not polished. But one <laughs> actor who was seriously influenced by the power of Mean Streets, the late, great James Gandolfini, mm. who saw Mean Streets four times in in a row. Wow. Wow, that's dedication. Yeah. And at the time, the great critic Pauline Kael had this to say about Mean Streets, quote, a true original and a triumph of personal filmmaking. And a great Schmovillian resident, Cody Bradley, <laughs> has this to say about Mean Streets. It has always gotten great reception, but it's a masterpiece. Keitel and De Niro were fun to watch, and it's probably Scorsese's most personal movie. Definitely. Definitely. One thing about, uh, uh, since we've been doing profiles, I've been loving the the uh, comments we've been getting on our fan page, which, by the way, this is a shameless promotion for our Facebook fan page, Profiles with Malone and Nance on the Schmoes No Network. You put us over a 1,000. Let's keep that going with thank the you. lights. We thank you. We are grateful for it. We're grateful for the comments. We're grateful that you're sending us tweets mm-hmm. at Alicia Malone and at Movie Mance. Please keep those tweets coming. And while you're at it, please go to iTunes and subscribe to our podcast profiles with Malone and Mance. Please rate and review us because these ratings and reviews are crucial so we can keep coming back week after week and coming back to these great filmmakers and actors and actresses that you're going to see in the weeks and months to come. The only way we can do that is with your help. But just the other day, one of our one of our friends, one of our friends, one of our followers tweeted us a picture and said, I can't wait to for your show, for your profiles on Martin mm-hmm. Scorsese for obvious reasons. And he tweeted us a picture of two movie posters. Yes. Two movie posters. And I wrote back, You are going to love our big picture segment of profiles on Martin Scorsese. So Shate, let's uh, roll that with a little help from the Pit Boss. <laughs> A picture says a thousand words, but Martin Scorsese's movie posters say a million. Just Just like Joseph Gelmas' rave review with the film itself, this brilliant one-sheet from Mean Streets is exquisite, compassionate, savage, and brilliant. Notice how the gun and the smoke seamlessly blend in with the city. It's an abstract image that says everything you need to know about this 1973 classic image that says it all this black and white poster for taxi driver robert de niro as travis bickle walking alone down a seedy new york street with his head down and surrounded by the scum he took it upon himself to try and clean up it's de niro again this time flanked by ray liotta and joe pesci one of the best mob movies ever made towering over a dead gangster displaying plenty of attitude it's clear that you don't want to mess with these good fellas and Scott, you've got that T-shirt on today. Uh, you've got yours on today. Both sporting our, our Goodfellas T-shirts. <laughs> got a got a if you got it, flaunt it, as they say. Well, listen, there are so many great movies. I have, working on this episode has been so much fun, 
And it has also been really, really hard yeah. to pick just five movies. We had a lot of debate about it. A lot of debate. Went back and forth. She didn't speak to me for like a <laughs> week. She's like, this show is never. over. I'm never doing it with you again. Never, man. Never. But uh, it's all good because we figured out a way to spread the love in our segment we like to call The Player by focusing on some of the unforgettable characters that may or may not be in our top five. Yep. Who was our first? Of course, it has to be Rupert. Rupert for Pupkin! From the King of Comedy. Who Often always mispronounced says, and misspelled. Thank you. <laughs> uh, he is such an interesting character because he is relentless. He is frustrating. He is deluded. He's also a but nice guy. But he's also guy. a nice guy. You feel for him at the same time. He just wants to get his comedy on the Jerry show. He just wants to meet Jerry Langford, played by Jerry Lewis, who is fantastic in this movie. Brilliant. But he's just, I mean, Rupert Pupkin is such a, a great character. This movie came out in 1983. And doesn't it feel more relevant now than it did Obsession back in the day? With fame. Yeah. Reality shows. Reality TV. And that line, better to be king for a night than, than a schmuck, schmuck for, for a, a lifetime. lifetime. I think a lot of people would agree to that. Better to have 15 minutes of fame than nothing at all. Right. And too many people are doing that these days. But one character that was on our list, but we had to include him anyway in our player, is just the one, the only Tommy DeVito, from played Goodfellas. by Joe Pesci from Goodfellas. You think I'm funny? You think I'm funny? But how am I funny? Tell me. How, how am I funny? funny? How? What was funny, it like the clown? first time you saw that scene? Terrifying. <laughs> because he is such a maniac. He is a psychopath and really unpredictable. So you never knew where he was going. I didn't know if he was serious or not. And when yeah. he laughs at the end, you feel a rush of relief. But Joe Pesci is brilliant in that role in Goodfellas, apparently. They say the F word something like 256 times. <laughs> Half of those times, Tommy says it. Oh. And so Joe's mother, when he, she saw it, she was like, I like the movie, but did you have to swear so much? Oh, that's hilarious. But even watching that scene over and over again, when you go back and watch the movie, even though you know that he's joking, it is still so uncomfortable. Great movie villain. Great movie villain. And he's such a, a, loose, a loose cannon, a live wire with a very, very short fuse. Of course, he gets his quite fast another character that we just love how do you how do you set this one up all you got to say is whoopsie daisy bill the butcher from 2002's gangs of new york a movie that i liked I, yeah. I liked it i thought it was a little uh overblown i would say but daniel day lewis was fantastic he's a standout another brilliant performance from him can you expect anything less terrifying as this crime boss brutal Someone you do not want to cross or ever meet. Well, you you definitely don't want to meet him in between takes because like so many of his films, most recently Lincoln, he stays in character when the camera is off and even when he goes like at night. So can you imagine like, you know, you go to a convenience store, <laughs> he's standing in front of you as Bill the Butcher. No. Yeah, you bump into him and he turns around and says, whoopsie daisy. <laughs> oh my gosh. But I, it's a it's a good movie with, with a great performance. I mean, he was definitely the best thing about it. And finally, Jordan Belfort from, from The, the Wolf, Wolf of, of Wall, Wall Street. Street. We mentioned him briefly before. He's a gangster of a different kind. He's a gangster on Wall Street. But unlike a lot of uh, Scorsese's other characters that you feel somewhat empathy for, or at least you like, you do not feel that for Jordan because... The fun part of watching a Scorsese film, he does always entice you with the, the glamour of the lifestyle that he's portraying, but it is also fun to see the downfall as much as it is to see the rise. Right. Wolf of Wall Street, not too much of a downfall. I mean, yeah, he goes like to minutes. a country club type prison for a little bit, and that's the frustrating part, and that's the reason why you don't like the character. And Leonardo always plays unhinged and bizarre really well but he this was the performance of his career yeah i, I mean think i felt so. like if there was ever a role where he really had a shot of winning the oscar this was the one but then he also had to go up against matthew mcconaughey for dallas buyers club always the way with him he's always just up against someone, someone that's who does, much flashier yeah, in their totally. performance well it's time for for our little quiz show mm. Can we get some some quiz show music going here my friend <laughs> Ding, 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 ding. I prefer without it because it just gives me more pressure. Okay, you go first. Okay, all right. So, quiz show. My question to you, Mr. Mance, is, so which mother played Rupert Pumpkin's mother okay. in The King of Comedy? Was it De Niro's mother, 
Jerry Lewis's mother or Scorsese's mother? Uh, Ma! 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 <laughs> Rupert! Rupert, turn what it are down! What going down there? <laughs> Ma, stop talking! Yeah. <laughs> so great. I'm going to go, just because he's used her before in some of his other films, I'm going to say it was Scorsese's mother. Correct! Yeah, that was Catherine. She's been in Goodfellas, Casino, The Age of Innocence, Cape Fear, Mean Streets, and Who's That Knocking at My Door? Ma! Ma! <laughs> my question for you, Miss Malone. Which of the following, oh, I think I gave you this answer before. Okay. Which of the following was offered the part of the talk show host in The King of Comedy? Oh, yes. But turned it down. I think you told me this off camera. I told you this <laughs> off camera. Darn it. Well, that's okay. Johnny Carson. Yay! Yes, I was going to say. Wait, wait. These were my other okay. other viable options. <laughs> was it Dean Martin, Johnny Carson, Frank Sinatra, or Sammy Davis Jr.? Yes, Johnny Carson. It was Johnny Would've Carson. Been good. Now, before we keep going with our Fast Five, I just wanted to talk about uh, extension of our player. Let's talk about the female characters. Oh, yes, This definitely. is something we were both talking about. When you rewatch a bunch of Scorsese's movie back-to-back, -back, you start to uh, notice how the female characters, apart from... Uh, does Alice live here anymore? Right. I think that's what it was called, right? Uh, Alice doesn't live here anymore, of course, with Ellen Burstyn. Y they're not the main roles and they're often objects and they're yeah. often really broken and interchangeable. I was thinking about this, but I feel like, and tell me if you agree, that his movies, they focus on these worlds that are inherently male, like right. the mob, like Wall Street. Sure. And in those worlds, they're quite misogynistic their attitudes towards women and they do see them as objects and this kind of goddess whore complex. Definitely. Do you agree? I absolutely agree with that. In fact, while prepping for the show, while I was binging on his on these movies that we've been talking about, one thing I noticed was that women do not come off favorably at all. Not even when there's a potential for a really strong role, like Vera Farmiga's character in mm. The Parted. Uh, it, it she didn't. There was an underdeveloped role, and it just the women just don't come off favorably at all. No, I mean they it's don't. something that's definitely worth pointing there's out. There's definitely memorable characters right. in his films that are women and and quite some strong moments but at the end of the day they're never the star except for Alice doesn't live here anymore which I haven't seen so I need to watch that one well but on the on that note you could also argue that while the women don't come across favorably well, yeah the men don't either neither do the men because they're just always that, despicable characters and, but like you said if they, if they are depicting Scorsese is depicting a man's world, world and we're following the main characters who are men yeah but and even though they may be cool to watch because they're just so well acted and well the dialogue is so great mm -hmm. but ultimately they're not admirable characters no not at all and he often explores the issue of masculinity and what that entails the kind of pressures that come along with being a man well i am with you 100 percent on that miss malone okay. <laughs> and now for number three on our fast five you talking to me? God. Yes, we are talking to you. We are talking right to you. Of course, we had to include this taxi driver, my favorite. Scorsese. Your personal favorite. My personal favorite. Why? Uh, you know I like films that disturb me. <laughs> <laughs> this will do it. Yeah, what? <laughs> you're such a it. nice person. I know. I, I like I like a film that transports me into a completely different world or a different mindset. And Taxi Driver definitely does that. It's uh, filled with loneliness and violence. Travis Bickle, such a great character. This alienated Vietnam vet who is an insomniac taxi driver. He's disconnected from the world. He is desensitized to violence. He is paranoid very angry and he sees himself as what an avenging angel would you say? he is the quintessential for the 1970s anyway the ultimate anti-hero and back in the day he became like the poster boy for that kind of flawed reluctant reluctant hero and another thing to say about taxi driver is if you ever want to know what new york city was really like in the mid-1970s Watch Taxi Driver. Oh. You know, we go to New York today. People live in there today. They go to Times Square. It's, fun. it's like Disneyland, mm -hmm. but much more crowded with a lot of traffic and with much bigger buildings. Mm. I mean, you feel safe in New York now, but back in the 70s, you didn't feel safe. And it's all right there on the screen in Taxi Driver, released on February 8th, 1976. It cost $1.3 million to make, was nominated for four Oscars, Best Picture, not director, mm. but best actor, supporting actress, and music, Bernard Herrmann. 
Yeah, well, that's what I like about the film is this kind of juxtaposition it has. It's got this beautiful score. Yeah. It's got uh, this beautiful cinematography. That opening scene is incredible. And then it has some really gritty and violent and it's dealing with the real dirt and scum of New York. So yeah. I like those two things together. And De Niro, of course, is brilliant in this role. He spent a month driving real taxis <laughs> yeah, in New yeah. York to get into the role and also researching mental illness. Mental illness, illness. yeah. But the, the the opening scene, like right after the Columbia Pictures opening uh, logo, mm -hmm. and then you hear the music swell up and there's this like cloud of steam and smoke and the taxi drives through it. Was there, it's, what, a, what just an immediate way to set a mood. There's a lot of symbolism in this film and Bickle is like a, a religious saint. But purging himself of weakness. Here's my question for you. Okay. Okay. The end of the film. Yeah. When Sybil Shepherd gets back in the in the taxi with him. Yeah. Like, what's your what's your take on that last scene? Uh, it's really surreal. I like the way it's left to uh, for people to discuss and decide for themselves. Mia, I always thought it was like his heaven, like he passed on. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, because you, know, you never see him get up from the couch. Exactly. That's what I assumed, but I know there are lots of different theories. I, I mean, I just, you know, when you're watching that scene, and Travis Bickle looks very much like he did at the beginning of Taxi Driver. Yeah. You know, there's no, he doesn't have any scars. There's no blood on him. And it's it's like this this dream state where you're not sure if it's reality or not. Mm. But I, I like your interpretation that he had, in fact, died on the couch after mm -hmm. that brutal shootout. And this that this was his heaven because he got what he wanted. He got a Sybil Shepherd to admire him mm -hmm. in the back of uh, his taxi. Yeah, I would love to hear from Schmoville what they have to say about that final scene and, and their thoughts on that one. Well, one thing that this movie definitely did have an impact on was John Hinckley. This was the film that 1981 caused John Hinckley to try to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. Yeah, and it, it was to impress Jodie Foster. Foster. Yeah, so this movie definitely, uh, five years after the fact, five years after it opened, it, had a, it still was having a big impact on uh, uh, society because of that. And Bernard Herrmann, this was his last score. Bernard Herrmann, you know, yeah. who did all those great scores for all the Alfred Hitchcock movies. Psycho. Psycho, Vertigo, North by Northwest. He also did the music for Citizen Kane. Yeah. And at first, he didn't want to do the music for Taxi Driver because he thought it was a car movie. <laughs> and it was anything but, but it was his last score. He died on December 24th, 1975. Aww. And that was the score they left us with. Just wow. after he finished recording. Well, let's find out what our friends in Schmoville had to say yes. about Taxi Driver. Dan Skip Allen, a regular resident in Schmoville, Hi, says Dan. Taxi Driver is a character study of a man slowly going insane. Mm -hmm. De Niro dials it back, but slowly his performance intensifies as he goes crazy. Scorsese lets De Niro build his performance as the movie goes along. The gritty style of New York, there you go, of the 70s plays into the overall feel of this great gritty 70s character study. Scorsese is just starting to get into gear, get it? <laughs> into gear. <laughs> Got it. With his film career with Taxi Driver. <laughs> well, I definitely agree with this comment from Nicholas Magaleri. Hopefully I was... Oh. <laughs> with movies like Taxi Driver and The Departed Scorsese creates a tension that is sustained throughout the movie until the climax where everything snaps. It's true. It's like bubbling tension and then it just boils over. But there was a chance. There was a chance where none of that could have happened because there was that scene between Travis and Wizard played by Peter Boyle mm. when he's telling him I just I just feel like I, I just got to do something, you know? I just like I'm just going to explode. I mean, he's asking for help. Yeah. And Wizard who doesn't really know what to make of it. It's like you're, you're, you're all right. Yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You're fine. You're fine. And he's like, basically, De Niro is standing there with like like tears in his eyes, ready to ready to just cry like a river. Mm. And he's being he's being dismissed. Ugh. So you never know what uh, could have happened if Wizard was actually a wizard and yeah. intervened. Well, we were talking before about the great music in Scorsese's films, and he has a history with working with music. He has a big history with working with music, and he definitely loves the Rolling Stones, <laughs> yeah. as we will find out right now in our segment that is just going to spotlight Scorsese's work in rock and roll. Martin Scorsese's passion for rock music on film started in 1970 when he served as assistant director and editor of the Oscar-winning documentary Woodstock. 
But with 1978's The Last Waltz, Scorsese directed one of the best concert movies of all time, the band's final performance at the Winterland Ballroom in San Francisco, which featured an all-star guest lineup that included Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, Neil Diamond, Van Morrison, and Ringo Starr. It wasn't until 2005 that Scorsese turned his eye back to music for No Direction Home, a fascinating chronicle of Bob Dylan's early years between 1961 and 1966. But Scorsese really got his rocks off in 2008 with Shine a Light, a career-spanning documentary about the Rolling Stones during their Bigger Bang U.S. tour. And from the Stones to the Beatles, there was 2011's Living in the Material World, Scorsese's intimate and revealing three-and-a-half-hour documentary about the quiet Beatle himself, George Harrison. Which made me cry. Aw, Ken! Ken. It's the old softy it's you! Softy. And did you like it? I managed to do the music for that yes, one. Yes, that sounded terrific! I got it together. You got it down! Great choice of songs, too. But the Stones... Boy, does Martin Scorsese love the Rolling Stones. Even we were talking about Mean Streets. Jumpin' Jack Flash. Jumpin' Jack Flash. That scene when Robert De Niro walks into the bar. That was a great so entrance. So cool. Any, first of all, anytime you're going to use Jumpin' Jack Flash in a movie, that you had me at a hello with that. <laughs> yeah. But the way he used that with Johnny Boy, with De Niro in that scene. And then in Goodfellas, he used a little bit of Monkey Man. Mm-hmm. In, in the uh, the fallout, when uh, when uh, uh, Henry Hill is like you know going crazy. And then in The Departed, they used... Uh, Give me shelter twice, yep. and I think there was another Stone song in there. But yeah, definitely loves the Stones. And he used the Stones in my underrated pick. So let's go to the good, the, the bad, bad, and, and the, the ugly. ugly. I will kick it off with one that um, I'm choosing to be my underrated, just because I think not many people actually know about it. It's a short film called Life Lessons. Oh, and it's included in the anthology New York Stories, which also had Francis Ford Coppola and Woody Allen doing their own shorts. Sure, yeah. Different stories from New York. It was in 1989, and it stars Nick Nolte as a painter who's desperately trying to hold on to his youth and his fame and his uh, relationship with his young assistant, Rosanna Arquette, who is just beautiful in this film and very, very powerful. The use of music is one of the reasons why I love this, as well as the truths it tells about relationships and the kind of torture and the power play on the dominance and the cinematography is brilliant but the moments of the short film that I love is when Nick Nolte is painting to the music of Rolling Stones or Bob Dylan and it feels like you're watching a music video. Wow. What's your underrated? Well my underrated a lot of people would argue that when you think of underrated you think of a movie like After Hours uh, Mm -hmm. but my underrated movie is The Color of Money. Because it didn't actually get very good reviews did it? It didn't and if you go back and watch the Roger, Roger Ebert documentary life itself which scorsese produced and is interviewed for there's that clip of siskel and ebert debating the color of money and ebert talked about he like he hated the movie and they were great friends scorsese and ebert they were great friends and and you can tell that scorsese was hurt but he appreciated that even though they were great friends he still had the 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 character and to be honest about whether or not he's like you know, I'm okay. gonna help you right. by telling you what you did wrong. Well, so I thought it. that movie had a lot of right to it. Uh, first of all, it, the return of Fast Eddie Felsen, 25 years after The Hustler. You didn't need to see The Hustler, which is one of my favorite movies, to to like The Color of Money. But uh, Paul Newman gave a fantastic performance. Mm-hmm. He won an Oscar for that role. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise held his own against and with Paul Newman in that film. Even that early in his career, he already had uh, he already had. Risky Business and Top Gun under his belt and he was already working with a director like Scorsese he was already mm-hmm. working with an actor like Paul Newman and I thought they were great together Yeah, and I just thought it was a very good film and again music big big part of that film great scene where where uh, Paul Newman's character is hustled by Forrest Whitaker that's a that's a fantastic scene yeah. but uh, you know it's just a very good film I'm, I'm, I'm with the color money okay I like your reasoning so overrated this one is hard okay is overrated uh, I'm choosing casino and I know a lot of people out there will be like why it's a really good film it is I mean it has really great visual moments Sharon Stone's performance is wonderful I think she's the bright spark in the film because because she's brilliant. And, you know, it's got great music, like always, with Scorsese, but I just felt like 
it's not good fellas it's not good fellas <laughs> and it's long and repetitive yeah. and it feels like it wants to be good fellas in vegas but it's not I, i'm with you on good on uh, on casino i think that's uh, that's an overrated movie movie i liked a lot but it does yes, you're right it is it's good fellas in vegas and it just follows the formula way too closely what's yours but my overrated was gangs in new york yeah. You know, I just felt like it was bloated. It was it was an ambitious film. It sort of meandered a bit. And there was a lot to admire about it. Obviously, we talked about Daniel Day-Lewis's performance. But uh, that's the movie that I maybe seen. I've seen it twice. And I feel really, it's not one that I want to go back to. We both agree on the, the, ugly, awful, the awful. The awful. The ugly, yeah. Kundun. Just feels like it's not meant to be in his filmography. It doesn't really stand out and... It's just strange to go like gangster film, gangster film, gangster film. Oh, a biopic about the 14th Dalai Lama. Yeah. And without a violent hero at the front. <laughs> True. <laughs> I, feel like I couldn't connect with it, which I know is probably something more to do with me. But no, I'm with you on Kundun. I, I just, it's, it's, again, a beautifully shot film. The cinematography is great, but it's, it's not a movie that moved me at all in mm -hmm. any way. And as far as overrated and underrated movies go in Schmoville, this is what Cody Bradley had to say about Casino. Mm -hmm. It's overrated. He goes, I still love it, but, well, like we just talked about, it really was just the good Phyllis formula done a couple of years later, and Pessy, that's Joe Pessy, basically plays the same crazy psycho. It's yeah. still really good but i think it's a little too long so do we and de niro and pesci's narrations aren't nearly as legendary as leotis well for underrated tyler myers says shutter island oh i actually shutter liked it island. okay so he says it may not be a masterpiece like goodfellas or taxi driver but it's still an eerie atmospheric and suspenseful film that borrows elements of horror and mixes them with elements of neo-noir DiCaprio also gives a fantastic and unhinged performance that I thought was one of his best. In my opinion. I-M-O. Well, one movie that was hailed as underrated by a lot of people from Schmoville was The Last Temptation of Christ. Yeah. Claudia Rose Weldon had this to say about The Last Temptation of the Christ. Uh, that's The Passion of the Christ. Sorry, this is The Last Temptation of Christ. <laughs> Scorsese put years of work and research into making it, and it stirred up controversy. Yeah, it did. At the time of its release. But it's not really discussed anymore, probably after being overshadowed by a different Jesus movie, <coughs> Kim Mel Gibson. It has Willem Dafoe's best performance, an excellent portrayal of Judas by Harvey Keitel, that is true. And speaking from the perspective of a theology student, it is a great exploration of the divinity and humanity of Jesus. Well, now it's time for your right stuff, Mr. Mance. It's a movie you just mentioned. It is a movie I just mentioned. It is The Color of Money. Which scene in particular? The scene that I love, and this is the scene that they used a lot in the trailers because it does sell the movie, is the scene when Tom Cruise as Vincent, he's all cocky and arrogant, and he's the, the camera is following him around the pool table in one continuous take while he's knocking the balls in the pockets while the werewolves of London is playing and he's singing along with it and people are cheering him on while he's sinking all the balls and on the side at Eddie Fels and Paul Newman is just looking at him disgusted because he blew his cover and now can't hustle any of these mm -hmm. people for money they know how good he is but while he's singing along to Warren Zevon's World of London he mm -hmm. knocks the last ball in he goes and his hair was perfect <laughs> yeah. it's just such a great scene that is a really good scene didn't make our fast five list color of money but one that did at number two is Uh. This is the music from the opening of Raging, Raging Bull. Bull. What a movie. Now, here's a film. A lot of people felt like maybe this will be our number one movie. It is a masterpiece. It is definitely a masterpiece. Came out December 19th, 1980. Nominated for eight Oscars. It won two. Best Actor, Robert De Niro. And Best Editing. First one for Thelma Shoemaker. Yeah, I like it because I'm not a sports movie fan, but it's not really a sports movie, even though right. it is. It's more about the mindset of uh, La Mota and and there's very few scenes in the boxing ring. And up to this point, it was pretty much unheard of to have a story about an athlete and not paint them in the best light. Well, the th I'm not a sports movie fan either. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a sports fan either. 
But if a movie is done the right way and it's about sports or sports are themed to it, like this one is, it doesn't matter because this is a compelling character study mm -hmm. of a very volatile, very flawed jealous, person. Jealous, paranoid. Paranoid. This is the study of masculinity we talked about before. Exactly. And this is a character who is, is not admirable in any way, but he's still so gripping and mesmerizing to watch. And, you know, De Niro broke ground he set a precedent when he gained 60 pounds for this movie yeah now at the time older jake no one no one had ever done that before mm -hmm. and he set the standard with it and set such a precedent that every time an actor or an actress gains weight christian bale or loses weight. Christian Bale. Christian Bale. <laughs> but look at what Christian Bale did for The Machinist. Yeah. I mean, he lost 60 pounds And then pounds American Hustle, role. he put on quite a bit too. And even when someone like Renee Zellweger gains like 20 pounds, for 20 whole pounds Bridget for Bridget Jones, people say, oh, she pulled a De Niro. Well, De Niro had been trying to get this film made for years. It was a passion project for him. And he was trying to convince Scorsese. He managed to do it when Scorsese was in hospital getting over his pretty severe cocaine and quaalude addiction. So then the two went to the Caribbean and they worked on the script together. And I love how it's shot in black and white. To yeah. me, it really evokes the era it was set in and it sets it apart from Rocky and all the other boxing films that followed Rocky around that time. And I've read somewhere Scorsese saying it looks like a tabloid being black and white. Well, that was actually a deliberate move to shoot it in black and white to separate it from Rocky. Although, even if it was in color, I think you would have been able to separate that thing from Rocky. The mm. only color in that movie was interesting choice that he used the home movies. Yeah. The home movie footage that they shot uh, was shot in color. And not really sure why, but it does give it a, a very unique look to it, and you definitely notice it when you're watching it. So this is a breakout role for Joe Pesci, too, wasn't it? Big because time. Before that, I think the Scorsese had seen him in, and De Niro had seen him in a B movie. Right. Uh, and he was about to give up on acting. And then they gave him <laughs> this role and pew, he became such a great character actor. Well, if there was ever a crime in Oscar history, oh yeah, this is the one that, that Raging Bull did not win Best Picture or Best Director. It <sighs> lost to Ordinary People. Ordinary People and Robert Redford for Best yeah. Director. The other films nominated were Coal Miner's Daughter, Tess and the Elephant Man. Great but year. When you watch, yeah, great year, great year for movies. But when you watch the last twenty minutes of that movie after De Niro has gained the weight, when he is in the jail cell, and he's going stupid, stupid, you're so stupid, and he's oh. punching the wall with his fist. Ouch. Why, 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 why? You're just going like. What? Give him the Oscar. <laughs> Give him the Oscar. But even with all the perspective that we have on film. When you, as jaded, as let's face it, and we are a little bit jaded because of all the movies we got to see every year. But when you go back and watch a movie like Taxi Driver, that's when you just go, that is Bull, a great friggin' like, movie. Yes. yes, Taxi Driver, Raging, Raging Bull, Bull uh, any one of the movies we've been talking about, Goodfellas, and yeah, uh, thank understand. you. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, Jake Bourgeois. Yes. Hopefully I said that right. From Schmoville said that Raging Bull is up there for both my favorite sports movie and my favorite Scorsese flick. But there is no doubt in my mind this is his most beautifully shot. I agree. The boxing scenes are some of the best ever put to film and the sparing use of color in the home movies to highlight the few light moments in this film has to offer was a brilliant call. Definitely. Now, before we get to our number one, let's talk about some of the directors we can see who've had a lot of influence from Scorsese watching Scorsese movies, particularly one movie of each of their, their filmography? No question. We were talking at the top of the show how Scorsese's style has often been imitated, never replicated, but these two filmmakers came pretty close to the point where you're watching the and movies did it going. in their own style. And did it in their own style. One of them is Paul Thomas Anderson. Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights. That is Goodfellas in the porn world. It is. In the 70s porn world. And just like Goodfellas, where you have the, the, the first half or maybe two thirds of it is the is the upswing, the, the glorification mm -hmm. of it. And then the last part is the downfall. It's like you could hold the mirror up to those films and they would they would definitely look very, very similar. Yeah, but Boogie Nights still stands on its own as like a brilliant, brilliant movie. Yes, it's disturbing. That's why you love it. Yeah, <laughs> I do. It's true. Yeah. Well, David O. Russell recently with American Hustle, American Hustle with Christian Bale. I watched that and I was like, Scorsese. It's totally Scorsese. But less so with, with David O. Russell. Like when I was watching Boogie Nights, I was like, wow, this is a great film. When I was watching American Hustle, I was like, okay, this is David O. Russell channeling Scorsese. Yeah, and it even has De Niro in it. 
It even has De Niro in it. <laughs> Only he didn't gain weight for this one. Um, but I liked American Hustle. I didn't love it, but I still thought that definitely watching the film, it felt very, very much like a Martin Scorsese movie. The music, movie. the multiple narrators, and Jennifer Lawrence, I thought her character seemed like right out of a Scorsese film. She would be perfect in a Scorsese movie because yeah, she's just a great actress. Okay, so now, oh, exciting. We come to it's our f- number one number on our one, Fast Five is... is- as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Good uh, fellas, number one on our list. So tell me why we chose this one, or why why did you particularly want this as number one? Well, for me, uh, yes, it could have been me. It could have been a uh, uh, raging bull. Yeah. But the reason I I wanted to go with Goodfellas is because this is the Scorsese movie I watch more than any other Scorsese movie. Yes. It is very entertaining. It is a vibrant, adrenaline fueled, fever dream of a film that is disturbing and funny with great dialogue great acting and it's two and a half hours long but boy does it fly the hell by the pacing is one of the reasons why i love this film because it starts off fairly slow and then it gets faster and faster and faster as it gets out of control and scorsese said he wanted it to feel like a speeding bullet towards the end where it's just everything is happening and it's really frenetic it's also the film for me that it felt like all of his movies up to that point that this was leading up to goodfellas right because it's the one that shows his trademark style right down to how much he had mastered his craft that copa shot that long, uh, long tracking shot, shot which is just brilliant yeah. and the use of editing uh the really quotable dialogue and then these characters who are despicable but kind of funny and also you kind of almost want to hang with them but terrified of them almost at the same time want to hang with them just make sure you don't you don't ask tommy devito to, to pay oh, his yeah. bill <laughs> oh, God. but so many great scenes obviously we talked about the how am i funny scene and you just mentioned the 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 copa scene but also after they, they pull off the heist, the LaFonza heist, and they're reaping the rewards of the money, and then slowly but surely, uh, Jimmy Conway, played by Robert De Niro, gets paranoid because everybody wants to get paid, and he starts knocking them off. Yeah. And there's the, the scene, it's the montage scene using the piano from Layla mm-hmm. that shows what's happening to all the other good fellas because they spoke up and they wanted their money. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that scene made me like I'm never going to go back and watch and listen to Layla in the same way ever again definitely not and Ray Liotta he had never carried a movie before this but he did such a brilliant job as Henry Hill it's great he used to listen to tapes of Henry when he was driving back and forth and uh, I love the scene right at the end spoiler alert where he (laughs) is locked in a prison of a different kind. Suburbia. Suburbia. Yes, but that's a great scene. He's just the, the last VO and he picks up the paper, looks at the camera, and he just kind of like smiles. He shuts the door and then there is Joe Pesci with his gun. Bam, 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 bam. And then the credits with the sex pistols <laughs> doing my way. You're yeah. just like, holy hell, what did I just see? During, this During uh, test screenings, people didn't like it at all. But, but now it's uh, it's lauded by many critics. It is lauded by really and everyone. people love watching it too. Over and over and over again, like we do. This new movie was nominated for six Oscars. It won just one oh. supporting actor for Joe Pesci, but it lost Best Picture and Best Director Dances to with Wolves. Dances with Wolves and Kevin Costner. God damn Let me ask you a question. If I, if I gave you a DVD right now for Goodfellas and a DVD for Dances with Wolves, what would you watch? Goodfellas. Goodfellas. It's much more fun. It's much more fun. I rest my case. <laughs> oh, well, before we go, let's read out a comment from Schmoville. Cathal Thomas Coleman said, Goodfellas to me is the quintessential mob movie. It's just perfect in so many ways. Screenplay, acting, editing, directing, cinematography as well. The scene where Ray Liotta goes through the club, the Copa scene in one continuous take is incredible. Must also mention the music. Scorsese has chosen songs which add dyna- 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 dynamism. <laughs> dynamism to many scenes. They all feel like they're meant to be there. Dynamism. Well, Bertrand Shailene has this to say about Goodfellas. Simply one of the most rewatchable, 
We agree. Movies ever. It's probably because of the characters. It's mostly because of the characters. You root so much for Ray Liotta. If Robert De Niro and even the ultra psychotic, and that's still an understatement. Joe Pesci. Yeah. I think it's the strong point of every Scorsese film, notwithstanding the direction. The characters are not idealized, mm -hmm. which is something we just talked about, yeah. uh, at all, yet are so endearing, and never is it so obvious as in Goodfellas. Well, I hope you all agree with our choices. Wait. Hang on. If you don't, what? We, we are coming to the end of our fourth profiles. Couple of uh, points of business we want to say oh, again. Yes. Please, please subscribe and check <laughs> us out on iTunes. Yes. And, on, and, and, and rate us and review us. We mm -hmm. have so many great directors that we want to, uh, so many great actors and actresses we wanna that get to. we want to get to. Also, and the only subscribe way to YouTube. YouTube slash uh, Schmozno podcast and tell us in the comments below what you think of our fast fight. And go to schmozno.com for all your <laughs> up to the date movie news. Best website around. And please follow us on Twitter at Alicia Malone and at Movie Mance. One last order of business we have to do before we let you go yep. is. All right, see now. Uh oh. Oh, no. This week, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this week is Alicia Malone's birthday. Oh no, so I hate while Schmozno. you're at it, what are you doing? While you are while you are going online, uh, while you are wishing uh, uh, while you are subscribing to us and while you are uh, doing the whole thing of uh, on on iTunes and oh, checking us so out. Sweet. Happy birthday to you. Can I make a wish? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday. Miss Malone. Yay! Happy birthday to you. I made my wish and it came true. Yes. Because we get to do profiles again next, next week. Next week, yes. So please check us out <laughs> on iTunes and subscribe, rate us and review us. But who have we got next week? Next week, we're going to take a little bit of a detour from our filmmakers and look at mm. one of our favorite actors. Who delicious. could it possibly be? Yes! Um, Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford is our spotlight on profiles next week. Which means I have to watch Star Wars again. And I will watch Raiders and Blade Runner and Witness. This is going to be fun, fun, fun. So come back next <laughs> week to Profiles. We'll see you next time. Bye. From producers Christian Harloff, Mark Ellis, and the entire Schmoes No Network crew, we would like to thank you for listening to Profiles with Alicia Malone and Scott Matt. Special thanks to Kevin Undergaro and Maria Madunos, the author of Every Girl's Guide to Diet and Fitness, in stores now. Be sure to subscribe to Profiles on iTunes and rate and review the show. To get other Schmoes No Network episodes, movie news, and join the conversation, be sure to visit schmoesno.com. I'm the Pitbull. And this has been a presentation of the Schmoes No Network.